When you went first slide. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Give it up for Randy, everyone. Oh. I wrote these as notes. He didn't have to put them here, but anyway. Oh, dear. My name is Randolph Hayden Wicker. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland in 19, on February the 3rd, 1938. And my given name was Charles Gervin Hayden Jr. My most significant uh, accomplishments in the gay movement actually all took place before I reached the age of 30. That means before Stonewall. I joined the Mattachine Society in 1958 at, at, six, at the age of 20. At the age of 20, I had to lie and say I was 21 because that was the legal age for joining. I was, perhaps you have read uh, either John D'Amelio's book, uh, the, he called me the first gay militant, uh, Eric Cervini, in his latest book, uh, the, uh, the Deviant versus the USA of America, used me to, as the foil, who all during the early 60s was provoking the existing gay movement, Mattachine movement, to start taking to the airways and starting public agitation. They didn't think they should do that until they had the approval of the psychiatrist so if we hadn't really started before that, we might still be waiting for the approval of the psychiatrist. I, I'm the last spokesman for the pre-Stonewall movement, standing and still fighting, and I'm not finished yet. But before I begin, there's something that I really realized that I really want to say I brought I brought with me my handy homemade wheelchair it was made by my friend who was a retired bank robber and legal representative uh, from the dog day afternoon fellow and he built this wheelchair out of just a folding chair so he could take his lightweight Alzheimer's mother, that's not her right now. <laughs> so he could, he could take her, you know, wherever. And what's incredible about this, the reason I'm telling you this is uh, I am, I have taken care of a number of people, and one of whom was Don Teal, who wrote the first book on the gay movement in 1972, filled with, filled with information and details, but not all that readable. And for the last two years of his life, he wanted to die at home, and I ended up volunteering, I took him home, and I had to go up there every week to hold him up in a shower so he could bathe. And for two years, he and other people I have known have let themselves be prisoners in their apartments where they won't go out on the streets or to the parks or by the river or even to a gay pride day parade because they are too vain. They don't want to be seen by anyone in a wheelchair. This wheelchair I have used in the Gay Pride Parade for about the last six or seven years because frankly, I'm not up to marching 35 or 40 blocks, whatever the length is. I'd be dropping, I did, the last time I did it really, by the time I reached the end of the parade, I, could, I couldn't make it to the streets pair three, three blocks north. So my message to all of you is really don't let yourself be a prisoner of your silly vanity and your old age 
and encourage people that you know in wheelchairs, volunteer. I'm sure there are people that will push them that they too can provide in this in gay pride or many other things if they just will not stop being self imprisoned by their own vanity in apartments. That was that was just added. That was just added today as I climbed into my wheelchair. Uh, I said, uh, my major uh, accomplishments in the gay movement were all done, as I said before, I was 30 years old. They mainly were, I was the first person to break on the radio in 1962. I was the first person to publicly demonstrate for gay civil rights in 1964 with an or organized demonstration, which included both gay members of Mattachine and members of the Sex Freedom League at the military induction center down on Whitehall Street. I was the first homosexual to go on the air and deal with live questions phoned in by viewers, which some of which were kind of heavy and hot to handle. I became very proficient at this, and you can see me if you put in YouTube, Gay Activist 1972. And my video pops up from Pittsburgh, but it's from 1972, someone told me it was listed as the first appearance, but it wasn't. And you can see that you know there's an art in answering questions when it comes to making public appearances. I had started doing that in the early 1960s. I would go over and talk to groups and everything else. As a matter of fact, one of the first, uh, I love the, the, in the New York Times Index, they covered a speech I gave at City College uptown which drew 300 students. And the description of the speech was, Randolph Wicker calls for acceptance of homosexuals as a legitimate minority group. We were not considered a legitimate minority group in those days. So people sometimes ask me, uh, oh, by the way, you, uh, when it comes to the Julius Bart, I missed it. Oh, I forgot the last important thing, is that I was a participant in the sip-in on April 21, 1966 at Julius's Bar. There's a picture of me up there on the, uh, this side, the Christopher Street side of the 7th Avenue fence. I'm the one at the end of the, I'm the cutie <laughs> at, at the end of the bar. I. I don't know that I really like it when people say, Randy, you were really cute in those days. <laughs> so anyway, I'm supposed to give a quick thumbnail. Why was I so different from other people? And I'm supposed to explain to you why it was that I grew up to be the kind of crazy, wild individualist that I have been. Well, it all began with being, having a very strange childhood. Until the age of 12, I lived with a stone death grandmother. And she had not one friend, because she was stone deaf and didn't know sign language or anything. And therefore, I had no contacts with other children my own age. Uh, at the age, they sent me to nursery school very early because I had no socialization, and the nuns sent home a report card saying that I didn't socialize well, <laughs> which I don't think I still do that well, <laughs> and that they should get me a dog. <laughs> that, that poor little cocker spaniel, I'd put her on my tricycle handlebars and throw her down the front, let her roll down the steepest hills. And it didn't do any good. So when I went to the first grade, because I understand because I'm, a I'm there and they're anxious to get me out into life, right? And also, they, they sent me early. I started the first grade at the age of five. This made me the youngest and smallest person in the first grade. And as a result, everybody picked on me. Well, my grandma told me first, she said that they pick on you because they know you're superior. 
which is a thing you should tell somebody when they're picked on. <laughs> it keeps them from developing a negative self-image. Then at school, I learned Jesus said, turn the other cheek. I found they just hit you twice as hard. <laughs> Grandma said, Grandma said, if they're bigger than you are, pick up a rock or a stick to even the playing field. <laughs> Jesus was wrong, Grandma was right. <laughs> At the age of 12, I was taken by my parents, my mother had tuberculosis for seven years, to Florida, to a little tiny mining, phosphate mining town in central Florida, which in central Florida is really, in those days, and maybe some, not as much, nearly as much today, was like more like the state of Georgia. I mean, we, it was, we were poor. I came from a very poor family. No one, my father was just an accountant. He didn't even get a CPA. So he was an accountant there in this company-owned town. And we lived in houses that were built, were little wooden houses built on pillars of red brick and heated by pot-bellied stoves that burned of pine knots that had a lot of resin in them. You'd have to get a good pine knot for it to really burn brightly and heat your house in winter. But we did have indoor toilets. We actually had plumbing, which is more than we can say for the other part of company town, which is only about five or 700 people. On the other side of the tracks where all the African-American people unfortunately lived. Well, it was really interesting because when we drove out on the highway, you would see Klansmen wearing their hoods going to rallies at the local drive-in. And on top of that, I was told by my parents, it was never tell anyone that your mother beat TB, TB tuberculosis, and don't let anyone know that we're Roman Catholics. Of course, that was the first thing. I was likely to tell anyone after that. I was never intimidated by ignorance and prejudice. I think I forgot to mention, among the charming things about where we lived in Central Florida, it was a dry county, and everybody, including my family, made their beer in the bathtub. <laughs> So what happened was that my father was ultimately promoted to New York City, a much better job, which meant that, unbelievably, it was a big enough promotion that they would be able to send me to college, which in those days was not hugely expensive like it is today, and I could become the first college-educated person in my family ever. And this... This was, a, this was really unique, and that's something we have to get back to, the days that poor people can afford to go to college and not end up being re-enslaved by, by student debt for the rest of their life. So my first year in college, I wrote a diary. I, didn't, I knew I was gay since I was, you know, came to puberty. And I, only, and I knew by reading books, that I, well, I knew by just listening, and I was one of those people other people called queers. And for some reason, they really didn't mistreat me because somehow my father had told me, you hold your books like this, or not like this, you know. So I had learned to, to sort of pass, so to speak. So I wasn't, I was not ever really harassed like some people are for being, you know, outrageous or faggoty or something as a child. Uh, but when I was in college, the only homosexuals, no one knew any homosexuals in there in those days. There was no, not one public homosexual spokesman or celebrity. Uh, there was only stories about Burgess and Menin, who were commies that ran off to Russia, betrayed the United States, or Leopold and Globe, the thrill killers that had killed a little child. And of course, in Florida, there was the Johns Committee when I was in high school, 
that was running up and down seeking out homosexuals at the local university, commies and homosexuals. It's always had two or three people that are victims together and unfortunately escaped all that. So I wrote in my diary, this is sort of an diary, I think it's very funny, that in my diary I said, I really just dream. I have this dream. One day I will meet one other homosexual. Dreams do come true. <laughs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, Daddy found my diary and read it too, which I had it in a locked box, but you know, parents tend, don't trust your parents, they'll break open. <laughs> they'll break open your locked boxes and read your diary. And he confronted me. And he said, he fortunately had gone to an enlightened psychiatrist who told him your son will always be this way. And he said to me, I read your diary, and I know, why you, I know why you're gay, because when you were a very little kid, four or five years old, you came into the bathroom crying, Daddy, why did Mommy go out and leave me? She had been taken away to a tuberculosis sanitarium the night before. Of course, that's not the reason I'm gay, but he gave my father the possibility of understanding. And he told me, he said, I know you'll always be this way because the psychiatrist told me so. He said, I just want you to know that I want to do everything I can to see that you are the best adjusted homosexual you can be <laughs> because I won't be here always to protect you. So I tell you today that I stand here proudly on the strong, loving shoulders of my father. And I hope, and I hope, I just so much hope that the advances we made in 60, the last 65 years have made it possible there are many, many more people that have parents like him. In 58, I showed him Mattachine literature. I discovered Gay Life in New York and discovered there was actually an organized gay movement called Mattachine. I think I mentioned I became the 16th member of the Mattachine Society, very small. For those of you who don't know, Mattachine was a society for gay rights founded by Harry Hay in 1950. Before Stonewall, people don't realize there was literally 20 years of activism I had several little different groups, but the total of people involved were only a couple hundred. So I took my father and I showed him the Mattachine literature because you know, I thought he'd be you know, interested or excited. And he read it. And first he said, and I would love to wish he, was, wish he lived long enough for me to bring him to see today. He said to me, I don't think you're gonna get very far with this. <laughs> I, even I am amazed how far we've gotten. But then he paused and kind of almost reluctantly said, son, I love you. Just do me one favor, will you? Please don't involve my good name. So here was Charles Gervin Hayden Jr., the senior, asking Charles Gervin Hayden <laughs> Jr. not to use our shared name. And that was the day that Randy Wicker was born. And it just happened to be in June 1958, which Pride Month, and that was 12 years before the first Pride even existed. <laughs> so today, I stand before you as a 65-year-old Randy Wicker, trapped 
trapped in an 85-year-old Charlie Hayden body. <laughs> no, not yet. Okay, yeah. So when I joined Mattachine, they called me the uh, young Akavar from the West because I was at the University of Texas. This is the famous, uh, in Austin. This is the famous Tex Texas Tower in the background where I was nearly elected president of the student body in 1960. The deans called me in and said, we can't have a homosexual being a public representative of the student body. And fortunately, I missed by 30 votes out of, of I think, a to out of the student body of 17,000, but I missed by only 30 votes, which was a relief to me, because what I had discovered was that at those days, you could not become a politician and have any chance of succeeding, because in those days, you know, homosexuals were just all considered to be mental cases, criminals, child molesters, communists, you pick the title, it was thrown at us. So anyway, when I joined Mattachine in 1962, in those days, you, because you didn't have any gay celebrities, there was, the only people you read about as homosexuals were in like case histories from 1870, when some, Music teacher seduced a student. So when I discovered, I heard, I, the mat, the mat, since the diagnostic uh, manuals of all psychiatry, the consensus was that homosexuality itself was defined as a mental illness. But you know, psychiatrists are in the business of curing mental illness. And you would have all these books and these people on radio and television saying they could save your gay son or daughter with just six sessions and God knows how much per session. Of course, no refunds if they failed. They just needed more sessions. I heard a program something like this uh, on WBAI-FM here in New York City. And I, frankly, was outraged. I went up to WBAI and I said, why in the world did you have a program with all these psychiatrists saying these, they're, you're really facilitating fraud, having all these psychiatrists promising cures for so much per session, and if it doesn't work, you just need more sessions. You know, this, that, that's really fraud. Why, we homosexuals, the real thing was that we homosexuals were and are the authorities on our own lives and on homosexuality. No one else. So, so, so what happened is the uh, BAI said, well, get a panel of homosexuals together and you know, we'll do an interview. And I did, I got six or seven friends together up in the Upper West Side. I had a bi interracial couple, a bisexual. Uh, my Puerto Rican friend failed to show up and a couple others. And they taped an hour and a half interview, and it was announced in the WBAI monthly program. Yes, in those days, they had printed monthly programs. They didn't have the internet. And of course, in those also, any homosexual in those days who opened his mouth for anything other than sex, you know, caused public hysteria. And right now, re the, the big one. I got, what happened was that this is a, this is a better, this is a cleaned up copy without Jack, Jack O'Brien's picture. But I'll just share it with you. It gives, it gives you a feeling for what it was like in those days. It said, July 9th, 1962. We've heard of silly situations at broadcasting. FM station WBAI wears, wins our top prize for scraping this sickly barrel bottom. WBAI announces a bit proudly, it will give eight young homosexuals equal time to tell their perverted side of the admittedly sad and certainly sinful <laughs> story 
because WBAI believes the rights of minorities to be heard. This lower depths decision followed the approach to the station's bubble-headed brass of a fellow bearing the card, public relations director of the Homosexual League of America. It wasn't that pompous. It was the Homosexual League of New York. <laughs> Is that a union? No, it wasn't. This arrogant, card-carrying swish claimed WBAI in a previous panel discussion of the homosexual in America had been unfair and it did not give the opinion of homosexuals. Show them the card-carrying swish picture. <laughs> now, this, this, this is from my TV appearances, which is the first TV appearance on, on television. So I wanted you to know what a card-carrying swish looked like. <laughs> Because I always wore a suit and tie, a black suit and tie, you know. And as you can see here, I, I, I look absolutely disgraceful, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I took this rave. Oh, I have to finish it. It gets better. It says, this eight-man or something panel, this man or something, you know, Friends have called me Miss Thing several times in my life, but no one has ever called me Miss Something. <laughs> They'll, we'll discuss uh, their homosexuals' feeling towards promiscuity, domestic life, police harassment, politics, social responsibility, careers, the difficulty and ease of living in New York, the dullness of straight society, and, of, and the reason that homosexual relations are so transitory. Yipes changed those call letters to WSICK. Now, I don't know if you realize it, but in those days, this was the greatest piece of PR and I could ever have dreamed of receiving because I took this news item and went up to w the New York Times where I walked in as a little old man in a suit and tie at the desk and I hand him my card and he looks at the card and at first he looks up at me and says does this card really mean what it says? Of course it said Public Relations Director of Homosexual League of New York and I said of course what else would it, what else would it, would it say? And so he picks up the phone and he tells somebody, he says, there's a gentleman calling here who, has, who is, says he is the public relations director of the Homosexual League in New York, and he wants to talk to you. Well, I tell you, within 30 seconds, there was a reporter <laughs> coming out of the newsroom, and in those days, which was really strange, reporters took you in a closet about the size of a confessional in a Catholic church, but without the dividers. And I did the same routine at every publication, every magazine, every newspaper, every radio and TV station. And what happened was it became, when it was finally broadcast, we got two articles in the New York Times, a rave review by Jack Gould, who was a famous columnist, reviewer of media, I uh, got stories in News, News, Newsweek, uh, a whole page in Newsweek called Minority Listening. And it was really laid the groundwork. So also the most important thing about all this publicity was that a bunch of very devout good Christians challenged the broadcasting license of WBAI. Because after all, let's face it, they had put perverts on the air. And that was appealed to the Federal Communications Commission, which was the licensing authority of every radio and TV station in the nation. And the Federal Communications Authority ruled that homosexuality was a legitimate subject for discussion on the airwaves. We had achieved our voice, and for the next two years or more, uh, every TV station, every radio station wanted a homosexual spokesman. 
The trouble was that the other members of Manashin who were knowledgeable and could be up very articulate didn't dare go on radio or TV because they might be identified by their voice and lose their jobs. So I was young and wild and free. No college debt, you know. I was the one that went. And that is why I, meanwhile I found out later that people on the West Coast were sending letters to all these people saying, you shouldn't be putting this Randy Wicker on the air speaking for homosexuals. He has no authority. Because, and these are the people from one magazine and the, gay, the small gay organizations who felt that I was a wild card, you know. And that was sort of like my biggest achievement in the gay movement. Now, uh, I, I now reach a point. I need the yellow thing. <laughs> this year, I've had the uh, honor of being chosen as the social justice warrior of the Heritage of Pride Parade. <laughs> so I really, I'm really honored by this, but this really means is that I have a uh, platform, I guess I should say my supposed 15 minutes of fame has come around again. If you live long enough, maybe that sometimes happens. And I wanted to talk about, huh? Oh, that's Andy Hum, who by the way, you should, you should listen to his program on YouTube every week. He gives you all the news in one hour, he and Ann Northrup, the real founders of journalism in this city. So, Gay USA, right, I missed it. Thank you. <laughs> I'm so busy listening to them, I don't notice the title of the program. <laughs> By the way, also on YouTube, what I failed to add is after later in life, I went on to be, to take in Marsha P. Johnson to live with me for the last decade of her life. And Sylvia Rivera and I became great friends after years of being enemies as I became enlightened about trans people. And she worked in my store as a manager and I, sh in my store, she actually worked and organized all the little isolated trans communities from all different cities and brought them together in the first march for transgender rights ever uh, down to Foley Square. And that, after that, fortunately, she, she got stopped using drugs and also stopped using alcohol. She was an incredible fierce advocate and I'm so glad that by year 2000, they had the year, uh, the, millennial, the millennial pride in Italy, and she was officially hailed as the mother of the transgender movement of the world. So here we are today. Now, today is June the 2nd. People don't realize it. But today is the 99th anniversary of the, of the passage by the U.S. Congress of the Indian, Citizen, Indian Citizenship Act in 1924. And this gave Native Americans the right to vote. We and yet we stand here today. This is, they say all politics are local. So I'll get as local as I can and point out to you that we stand here today in Stonewall National Park and there's Stonewall Bar. And one block away we have Julius's, which has now become a nationally recognized historic landmark. You know, and has made gay bars legal. But we, Unfortunately, uh, we have a statue behind me that uh, is of General Sheridan. Now, one thing that some of you may not know, I hope I remembered to say LGBTQIA2S, 
That's the full list of letters that I intended to say earlier, but I had forgotten. But 2S stands for two-spirit. And that's because many American tribes consider gender nonconforming people to be two-spirit people, which was really one female, one male. And they often turned them into shamans. And they were considered uh, kind of people with special insights and special powers. But the uh, Gen General Philip Sheridan behind us, uh, this statue was put here in 1936 only because it was actually a sort of a battle between cities in the South who were erecting monuments to you know, Jim Crow era monuments to the Confederacy. You know, and so the people, cities in the North, including here, even my hometown of Hoboken, were erecting monuments to heroes that fought on the, against slavery on the right side in the Civil War. Uh, and that's how they ended up creating General Sheridan and putting him here in Stonewall Park. He really is a military hero for fighting on the right side in the Civil War against slavery. But the but was that he committed genocide against Native Americans all over the plains, whom he called savages. He couldn't defeat Native Americans on the plains because they could ride in on horses. He was marching in military formation, and he, was, he literally couldn't handle fighting them on their own terms. So what he did is he decided, what he actually did was he started eliminating, decided the only way to defeat them and force them to live on reservations was to deny them a food source by this ex virtually exterminating the American bison. He, his most famous, uh, this, the most famous statement allegedly attributed to him is, the only good Indian is a dead Indian. He famously declared in 1874, because after the, you know, the plains were still having herds of Indians, after professional hunters trespassing on Indian land had killed four million uh, buffalo, he said, let them kill, skin, and sell until the buffalo is exterminated. And ironically, you know how politics are so m messy? Later on, when there were only 500 left, they sent him to Yellowstone to rescue the last 500 existing buffalo. So this man does not deserve to be in our park. He really deserves to be, like Teddy Roosevelt, they took away because of his demeaning attitudes toward Native Americans and, and, and also African Americans relocated. This man needs to be relocated either to Grant's tomb or a Civil War battlefield, somewhere where he might right, rightfully stand, but not in the heart, a Stonewall National Monument. And we have here, we have started a, position, a petition on change.org, which uh, you will read in detail if you copy the square in the middle. Uh, and we intend to start promoting that starting today because we want him out of here within one year before the 100th anniversary, giving American, Native Americans the right to vote. That, we want this community to be known for love and equality. Someday maybe they'll even change the, this sub, subway stop name, change it to Equality Square. Thank you very much. Well, I think we all learned a lot today, right? Make some more fucking noise. Make some loud noise for Randy Wicker. Oh, my goodness.